to my attention and I trust will serve our church body well. That's the prayer of my heart. And I would ask you to join me in prayer at this time. Heavenly Father, I thank you very much for every man and woman and young adult and boy and girl in this room. Each life has been individually created with the ability to know and to love you and to serve you. We thank you for our children in this church and for godly families in which they are being reared. We thank you for the young adults and the promise and the energy and the life that they have and pray that they will continue to conform their life to that of Jesus Christ, to be transformed through your Holy Spirit in their thinkings and priorities. I pray, Father, for every adult here, those who have families, those who do not. I pray that each of us will understand and will accept and respond to the responsibility we have to rear our families, to know and to love you. Father, as much by the life we live as the talk we talk. Help us to bring you glory in all that we do and say. And please be with us for the minutes that remain this morning. Father, we're here to redeem the time. Every person who is here, could be somewhere else right now, but has chosen this place to be. And Father, we, each one of us, humble our heart and spirit before you, praying that your Holy Spirit will speak through thy holy truth. In Christ's name, amen. You've probably heard... The short cliché, to love the world to me is no chore. My big trouble is the person next door. (laughs) I've heard it before, but I smile every time I hear it because I know the truth that that conveys. And while we may speak about the universal church or the church being the body of Christ in a broad, general sense, What impacts our community the most is how Christ has transformed our individual life. And that story is told in the ordinary moments of life every day, wherever we may be and whatever attitudes we may choose to have. The next time we get angry when somebody with 12 items gets in the 10-item express lane ahead of us, Let's check just for a second the kind of attitude and patience that we need to have as a believer. The next time somebody cuts us off in traffic and, and the best thoughts don't necessarily come to our mind, but perhaps we're, we're thinking, how could you? Let's reflect on how our individual testimony and witness has a bearing on what others think about us. The neighborhood of this church and the neighborhood that each of us lives in day by day will see Christ in the lives of those who not only profess Him, but live Him as Lord. The Christian life and witness is not one that can be lived by proxy. You cannot hire somebody else to do it for you. We cannot ask somebody else to be a Christian for us. We cannot, there is no such thing as a surrogate Christian that because I wake up in a bad mood today, I'm going to ask somebody else to be holier Ken Anderson than what he feels like being this particular day. Every day is that moment in time that we either confess or don't confess our Lord and Savior in the way that we should. Others picking up our slack means that we are not doing what we 
should be doing before the Lord. A church, a local church, is corporate or group worship of individuals. And it is individuals and our respective commitment to Christ that will determine the effect of this local church for the kingdom. It is not the, the word C-H-U-R-C-H. Sorry, check my spelling, will you? Just seeing if you're awake. It's not C-U-R-C-H. It's C-H-U-R-C-H. It's every person in this room. The church, while it is corporate worship, will be no richer, no more meaningful, no more effective for the kingdom than the lives of every individual person in the church. An important principle to remember is that every local church is an assembly of individual believers. And as we individually grow toward or away from God, our church grows toward or away from God. Each one of us has a respective responsibility and duty to respond to the message of God's Word in our heart and life. I know you're going to have a hard time believing this, but I played football for three years. I know what you're thinking. Ken, you're so skinny, you've got to run around in the shower to get wet. No, sorry. That's... I played football. That was a joke, folks. That's the best I've got. I just emptied the whole book right there in front of you. Now, I never had a coach like this, but I have heard of a coach who got his team together and said, We are undefeated untied and unscored upon and ready for our first game. (laughs) Teams that I played on my last two years in high school, my first year in college. And by the way, there are some people here who know that I used to be a bigger boy, right? So this is not as unbelievable as it might think. Teams that I played on in high school and college Never, ever lost a game in practice. (laughs) And we never, ever won a game without training and practice. Many of us confuse the issue. What, What we call training and practice and growth in the Lord... God calls the end. He says, this is where I want you. I want you continually growing and maturing in your faith. No human being on the face of this earth will arrive Christianly. I mean, if the Apostle Paul had to say, I have not yet attained that, how can any of us think that we will? But we must be committed to to growth and to understanding and to obedience by which much understanding comes. Much understanding about the Christian life is as we progressively obey His truth. Not as we just intellectually try to dissect it, but are we willing to step out in that proverbial step of faith? One of the purposes of the local church is training in the fundamentals of the faith. Opportunities to teach in Sunday school. Opportunities to hear men of God and missionary men and ladies as they present their work. Opportunities to worship God in the most beautiful universal language on earth, music, that He has given us for special praise to Him.
Paul addressed individual responsibility to Timothy. And if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. This is not our text for the morning, but it is our first reference. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. Timothy, let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. I, I'm reading from New American Standard. Verse 13. Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you. Take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them, so that your progress may be evident to all. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things. Persevere in these things. For as you do this, you will ensure salvation for yourself and those who hear you. We are members and attendees of a local church. A church that was founded approximately 1945 and that God has used in wonderful ways in terms of those who have attended and in terms of missionary outreach. But this church and whatever God has done through it is only the result of what God has done through the faithful individuals in this church. The church as a word or concept itself is only the people who attend. Our personal responsibility just as to Timothy, is a persevering responsibility. So what are some of the responsibilities we have? And being a typical preacher, I have three points. Will you turn to Hebrews 10? This is our text for the morning. Hebrews 10, beginning in verse 23. I like to think of this as Paul speaking to a local body of believers. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. There are, in my view, three requirements here for a local church, but only individuals can fulfill these requirements. The first, in verse 23, is, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. The first thing a local church must do is not compromise the truth. One of the main purposes of the epistle to the Hebrews was to counter a departing from the faith that was occurring. The word is apostasy, but the root word of apostasy means to depart from something. And one of the principles of this epistle was to encourage early believers to remain steadfast and firm in their commitment to the truth, and particularly a twofold truth. I'm not talking now about a lengthy doctrinal statement. I'm talking about two key tenets that Paul would be referring. That Jesus Christ is God become man and Savior and resurrected, and that He's coming again. 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4 expresses the gospel in no uncertain terms. That Jesus lived, was killed, buried, and rose again. The New Testament story, if you read through the book of Acts, at 
several times, many times, the primary truth that the apostles brought out to those with whom they were speaking is that this man, Jesus, whom none could deny lived because he walked among them and saw him killed, is now resurrected. The first and most important principle that we have and that we need to confess as a church is that Jesus Christ is God become man, did die for us, did rise again. And the second is that he is coming again. And this is referred to in the end of verse 25 when the writer says, As you see the day drawing near. One of the evidences that this young church was truly committed to Jesus Christ was that they would persevere in spite of much untruth around them. And that they would hold firm to the undeniable truths of the gospel. Let me read to you several verses that help show how much the book of Hebrews addresses this point. And you can turn, if you're in Hebrews 10, turn back to Hebrews 3, if you will. Hebrews 3, verse 5. Now Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken later. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are if we hold... Excuse me, if we hold fast our confidence and the boast or the expectation of our hope firm until the end. The critical need for the church, the critical need for the local church, or in terms of the theme of our morning, the critical need for the individual believers within the local church is to continue to hold fast to the truth of God's Word in absolutely every way and in affirming its priority and rule in their life. In Hebrews 3, verse 14, For we have become partakers of Christ. If we hold fast the beginning of our assurance, firm until the end. Hebrews 4, verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. Hebrews 6, chapter 9. Or Hebrews chapter 6, verse 9. Beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you Things that accompany salvation, though we are speaking in this way. God is not unjust, so as to forget your work and the love that you have shown toward his name, and ministered and still ministering to the saints. Verse 11, And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence, so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. The concept of the end to New Testament believers, to first generation Christians, was very, very real. It was either an end if you upheld the faith in a culture that didn't honor it. It was an end that more often than not ended in persecution and perhaps martyrdom. Or it was the end they prayed for, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this epistle is encouraging us to remain firm in our confession and the hope that we have in Christ as Savior and coming again. Hebrews 10.36, the chapter we're in, verse 36 says, You have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. Many of God's blessings are known through patience and steadfastness. These verses are unmistakable in their message. That in the culture in which we live and in the times in which we live, 
in the schools we attend and the professions that we honor by our service and the homes and the children we rear, there will be many, many influences away from staying faithful to Christ. As the administrator of a Christian school, I often hear something along the lines of, well, we want our kids in the real world. May I say to you that children in Christian schools see the real world just driving up and down K-96 like I do and through Wichita looking at billboards. (laughs) If you watch television, you see the real world. And I would even make a more emphatic point that we do God a disservice by calling this sinful world in which we live and which Satan is still permitted to have some sway, the real world. This is the first of three points in terms of the mission of the local church, but I want to spend just a few minutes on the next two because... You know, I think as a church, Calvary has probably, has certainly endeavored to do a good job of holding fast the confession of our hope. We have a statement of beliefs that we reflect, that we believe reflect biblical truth, and we confess them. But there are two other things this text tells us to do as a local church. Verse 24, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Now, some translations have this very interesting word in it. Let us consider how to provoke. And thankfully, it doesn't end there. One another. And thankfully, it doesn't end there. (laughs) Let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds. How long has it been since... Let me address this to myself. I don't often talk to myself like this, but Ken, how long has it been since you've woken up in the morning and and God has laid some brother or sister in Christ in this body of believers on your heart so that you can encourage them to a good deed that day? How long has it been since we have prayed for those who are on our left and our right and and before and behind us to encourage them in their life that God will use them to honor His kingdom and to put flesh on this doctrinal statement, the kind of fresh flesh of Christian love and commitment that truly is the book that others read. We know that. Just a few of us, you know, types, weird might be what's really enjoy theology. (laughs) No, everybody who enjoys theology is not weird, excuse me. But aren't we all looking for application of truth? God's Word expresses principles upon which we can base our life. And this is an emphatic express principle to a New Testament church. Perhaps 30 to 40 years after Jesus came out of the tomb, 30 to 40 years, some of us are even older than that, and he's saying, stimulate one another to love and good deeds to make your body an effective body for the kingdom. Notice the verse. Let us consider how to stimulate one another. Our focus is one another to love and good deeds. The object or the result of our love should have a measurable effect. It should not just be hypothetical. 
love and good deeds from the body of Christ should be discernible. They should be food bankable. They should be ladies' missionary fellowship. Two organizations at the church by which we try to minister to others. But those are both organizations composed of individuals who share the objectives of those organizations. Each of us has a way. Listen to Romans 12.10. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligence. Be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Persevere in tribulation. Be devoted to prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Practice hospitality. 1 Thessalonians 4.9 says, Now as the love of the brethren, you have no need for anybody to write to you, for you are taught by God to love one another. 1 Peter 1.22 Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls, for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another. You know that verse... That's one of those verses with a kind of a language in it that just, sometimes it goes in one ear and out the proverbial other. Let me tell you what Peter is saying here. He's saying, since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls. In other words, since you have eliminated wrongful motives in your love for other people. Since you have eliminated any conflicts of interest. Since you you are sure you are right before God in your own heart and life, then you can effectively love others as we should. Loving our brothers and sisters in Christ is giving them the benefit of the doubt when we question what they may have said or done, rather than jumping to wrong conclusions. That's an evidence of love. I trust you. I trust who you are. I know your life is committed to Christ. If you have done or said something that I have heard that I think is inconsistent with that, I give you the benefit of the doubt rather than jumping off the deep end emotionally. Titus 3.8 says, This is a trustworthy statement. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God may be careful to engage in good deeds. In a real sense, what we do good for others does good for us. Final point, verse 25. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as the habit, as is the habit of some, but encouraging, encouraging one another. One objective of worshiping as a body is to be an encouragement to one another. An encouragement by our attendance, an encouragement by our attention, an encouragement by our obedience to what the Lord says to us. Hebrews 3.12 says, Take care, brethren, lest there should be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart in falling away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, lest you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. This exhortation in verse 25, to not forsake assembling, as is the habit of some, they forsake it, But to encourage one another is what I like to think of as the original affirming action. 
Our, our political term is affirmative action. This is affirming action. This is my telling you, thank you for ministering to my heart by what you shared today. Thank you, Nancy, for your faithfulness. for the rich music that we enjoy. Thank each of you for times that you've had the opportunity to speak or encourage one another in the faith. This does not take an organizational chart to do. You know? We don't have to have this graphic with a box at the top and 42 boxes in between with lines going every direction. This is the Spirit of God moving the heart of His people to be an encouragement to one another and to stimulate one another to good deeds and to give them the benefit of the doubt rather than being hyper-judgmental or critical in any way. This is preacher's psychology for we're almost done. Chuck has many times... encouraged us, rightfully so, and it's been in the bulletin and perhaps is today, (laughs) I'm seeing today's bulletin, to pray for the church. Do we realize that if we accept that exhortation, we are saying... We will pray for these people. Not God bless the church. Do we realize that if we accept the challenge to pray for this church, we will be on our knees or in whatever other posture serves the purpose that day and we will be going through these people name by name that's the only way we're going to pray for the church the church is people now I don't say that God doesn't understand that When we say, I pray for the church, I'm praying for all of you. But what difference and what a difference does it make in my life if I say, God, be with Donita today and encourage her and those with whom she meets. And God, be with Henry. What a blessing he is. Encourage him. It makes a difference to me. Those who know me well know that I have my meticulous moments. Please don't ask Evelyn about this. But things are generally at right angles on my desk. And... It's an affliction, folks. That's just the way it goes. We had a house once. When I have a chance to be outside, I like to work on the lawn. I like to mow, trim. I like it to look nice. Now, we were in a house in which it was a cul-de-sac, and the curbs were not the way curbs should be, like 
you know, eight inches up and down that you can't drive over them. They were these slanted curves. And there was a dear lady who would always miss the curb and drive right over my lawn. And as often as not, park her car right on the corner of this lawn. Now you, you have to be afflicted like I am with meticulousness to, to object to that. Some of you are saying, you know, get over it. <laughs> I have. But this is how. <clears throat> this is as vivid as yesterday. I was, I was sitting on the ledge of a dormer window, leaning out over it, trying to chip ice, this is ten years ago, away from, from the, the gully along the dormer because it was, contra- it was freezing and then recontracting and leaking in. And here comes this young woman. I mean, I'm looking right down at the lawn. It doesn't make any difference. It's winter time. <laughs> she pulls up, parks on the corner of the lawn. And she looks up and she says, Hi. And I, I respond, Hi. I know a little bit about this woman's life that she is actually a guest with our neighbors because she needs some help right then. And the Lord begins to work on my heart. And his message is, pray for her. It was absolutely impossible to stay angry with her and pray for her. I couldn't do it. I know you're wondering which I did. I prayed for her. I prayed for her. May I ask you that if you're to join me in a in a covenant of praying for this church by, and I realize folks have come, and I won't say this, and this absolutely is the final thing. There are some names and people in here who are no longer members of this church. Pray for them. Pray for God's perfect will and peace in their life. But will you commit with me to bringing three or four or five names a day and really pray for the church? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your Son, for his atoning blood, and the incredible grace that says that we are saved through faith. Thank you for every person in this room for the time we've had. Help us to honor you, realizing that we are a church because we are individuals who are mutually committed to you. And that as individuals, we have a stewardship and an accountability before you and that our faithfulness in being stewards 
will have great positive effect on one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.